Hello and welcome aboard our Piper Cherokee Cruiser. We're on the ground at Tacoma Narrows Airport in Tacoma, Washington. And today we're going to take a flight down to the Oregon coast to a place called Nehalem Bay. That's about 100 nautical miles. This is a flight I did a little over a week ago in also a Piper Cherokee Cruiser. So I'm going to replicate that flight and I'm going to include some still photos and videos that I took uh, during that flight. We're going to be using ForeFlight today, and so I'm going to bring it up and just kind of show you what's going on weather-wise. A little bit iffy out at the coast. I've got ForeFlight set to show cloud ceilings. You can see that setting right here. And what that does is whenever there's a color box, either green, blue, or in this case, this one here is a magenta color, and then red, it's going to show you that the cloud ceilings are, in this case right here where it's red, are quite low. And that is part of our flight path. I don't know if that's going to clear uh, by the time we reach that location or not. But be aware that as we fly along this route, uh, just to give you a look at the coastline, I, I may need to switch it over to VFR, force it into a VFR so you can kind of see what's going on. And then I'll stitch in the videos that I took along the coast here. So the way it's set up is the uh, green, those are good cloud ceilings for VFR flight. Blue is kind of a, hey, pay attention to that. It, they're getting a little bit lower. And then, of course, as the colors get closer to the red end of the spectrum, it's like, uh, hey, warning, guys. It's uh, really low ceilings out there. So we'll keep that in mind. And uh, let's go ahead and hop inside the airplane. I'll talk a little bit first about the, our flight path. So I've got uh, it, the four flight program to take off from Tacoma Narrows, and then we're going to head almost due west uh, over here, and then we're going to shoot down. We're going to uh, stay out of Olympia's airspace. That's right here. That's Class Delta airspace right there. So we're just going to kind of skirt that and head over, join the coast, and then head down to Nehalem Bay, which is a really cool airport. I'm going to go ahead and bring that up so you can get a look at it. So four flight allows you to get a 3D view. So that's the, uh, the runway right there on the coast. So we'll check the weather down there and see most likely, in all likelihood, we're going to be approaching from this direction and landing toward the north, just generally based on prevailing winds. So let's go ahead and see what we got going on down there weather-wise. Now, there's not going to be automated weather at that small airport, but it's going to give us the report for the nearest, which is Tillamook in this case. Looks like it's finding the weather right now, kind of spinning, trying to find it. And when that comes up, it'll give us a general idea of what, what's going on down there. And if that takes too, too much longer, I'm just going to bail out of that and come back into it in a little bit. But let's go ahead and do that. All right. So let's uh, get the airplane started and get on our way. So we're going to run through a checklist. I have a checklist up here on a separate screen. So I'm going to be kind of looking over there. You're going to see my head go back and forth, but I'm just going through checklist items. So documents and handbook on board, seats adjust, seat belts secure, brakes are set, radio switches. Let's make sure everything is off. Master avionics is off. We're going to go down all of our light switches. They are all off. And master is also off. Okay, circuit breakers check in. All circuit breakers are in. Fuel tank selector to the fullest, and we're looking over here, and it looks like both tanks are equal. So it's set right now to left tank, and we're going to leave it right there. Carburetor heat set to cold. That's here, and mixture is set to full rich, and we're priming it because it is a cold start. So we're going to give it three pumps on the primer. Okay, that's done. And master switch on and fuel pump on. So we're going to turn the master on, fuel pump on. And we're going to go ahead and look for a rise in fuel pressure right here, showing positive fuel flow. And we're going to turn the pump off. All right. Throttle quarter open. So we're going to set the throttle one quarter open. We're going to look and make sure no one's around the airplane when we start it. And clear prop. And let's go ahead and start it. So we're going to turn the ignition on and press and hold the starter button until we have a good start. And there's a good start. I'll bring the RPMs down. There we go. Okay, so we're going to look at our oil pressure. And it's on the left edge of the green. And that should come up. 
a little more with time and lights radio and transponder on so we can duck on our rotating beacon on we'll put our strobe on master avionics on instrument lights on so we're good there and transponder will set to standby and we're squawking VFR 1200 okay so we're going to simulate unfortunately pilot edge does not give ground up um, tower <coughs> air traffic control here at Tacoma Narrow. So we're gonna simulate that. And I've got the Garmin 430 set to, I'm just gonna ignore that. It said actually, I think that's Olympia uh, VOR right there. Well, I'm not going to be using that for this flight. We're gonna be using for flight and severe far flight. So we're gonna be navigating by landmarks and that sort of thing. So, but that's kind of an overview of where we're going this shows where we are on the runway, north hangars. So we'll simulate getting clearance. We'll taxi over to the run-up area, uh, do a run-up and get on our way and keep our fingers crossed on the weather. All right. So let's uh, make sure we have all of our frequencies set and correct. Oh, that's given our FBO information. We don't want that. Let's do this a different way. Okay. Okay, so we have ground 1218, that's set here, tower 1185, and ATIS 12405 in COM2. So let's give a listen to our ATIS. Tacoma Narrows Information Quebec 1600 Zulu weather Wind light and variable, visibility more than 10 Sky conditions 1300 scattered, 3300 broken, 5300 overcast Temperature 17, 2.14 Altimeter 3016 Arriving runway 35, departing runway 35 Advise on initial contact, you have Quebec. Okay, so we have Quebec and runway 35. So it's clear. Let's put our ground frequency in. Tacoma Ground, Cherokee 7428 Romeo at the north hangars with Quebec. Taxi VFR departure to the west. Cherokee 7428 Romeo, taxi runway 35 via taxiway Alpha. Runway 35 via Alpha, Cherokee 7428 Romeo. Okay, let's go ahead and taxi over to 35. I'm going to bring up full flight. So there may be occasions on this flight where we're going to fly into clouds. Uh, would not normally do that on a VFR flight, but since it is a simulation, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I would not do that in real world flying unless I was on an instrument flight plan with clearance.
And as I said earlier, if need be, I'll uh, force a VFR weather into the simulator so we can have a look at the ground and see what the Oregon coast looks like. So as you can see here, it's a 5,000 foot runway. Makes for a nice long taxiway from North Hangers. So I'm going to go ahead over the here so I can stay out of everybody's way. Runway 35. Okay. So we'll go ahead and run through our before takeoff run up elevator trim. So the elevator is on the ceiling and that is set to neutral. We also have rudder trim down here. So that's also set to neutral. Again, my head's going to go back and forth. My checklist is to my right side. Elevator trim is set. Flight controls. Checking ailerons. Elevator. Rudders, flight controls free and correct. Setting directional gyro, artificial horizon, and altimeter. So we'll look at our magnetic compass showing 280. And 280 set. Artificial horizon calibrated. And an altimeter was set to ATIS. All right, continuing on, fuel quantity, check and verify they are sufficient and balanced for today's flight. Mixture set to full rich, throttle 1800 RPMs. Mixture is set to full rich and throttle to 1800. 1800, checking magnetos. Check left. It's about 100 RPM drop for both left and right magnetos. I'm going to check carb heat. Should be a slight drop in RPMs. That's check. Checking suction gauge, and it's in the green. Now we're going to check our ammeter. Should slow us, show a slight charge when I turn the lights on. There's a charge. Engine instruments. Oil pressure, fuel pressure, and oil temperature are in the green. All right, setting throttle to idle. And fuel pump on. Again, we're going to verify positive fuel flow. All right. Throttle friction lock adjust. Radio is on and set and lights as needed. So we'll go ahead and turn our landing light on. And we're going to switch over to tower. Set there. Transponder set to altitude. Wing flaps are set to neutral and door latched. And ready to go. Okay, so we're going to taxi out to the hold short line. Approaching runway 35. And we'll go ahead and get our takeoff clearance. Tacoma Tower, Cherokee 7428 Romeo, holding short runway 35, ready for departure. Cherokee 7428 Romeo, winds calm, runway 35, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff runway 35, Cherokee 7428 Romeo. Full throttle. 
for 75. And 75, rotate. Way to climb straight out to pattern altitude and turn out to the west. Climb. Speed is 85 miles per hour, and that's the outer ring on the scale. So if I bring up AHARS, which is right here, it'll uh, bring up uh, the CDI cor course uh, deviation indicator, that magenta arrow that you see there, which really behaves the same as a CDI in a localizer or in a uh, VOR navigation radio. So I'm going to use that. You can also make that full screen if you want to. I'm going to bring it up to 2,500 and see if we still have VFR. showing 110 knots over ground. Distance to my next waypoint is 18 nautical miles. Not gonna go any higher than, than 2,500.
right now at our present altitude if if the a horse perceived that there were any i'll use the word threats which would mean terrain that's either very near or above your current altitude they would show up here either highlighted yellow or red the other thing is on profile view you can see here's our aircraft and this is the terrain in front of us out to about 50 nautical miles so right now there's no again i'm using the word threats to our present altitude and heading So we're not held to this course per se. 
but I'll go ahead and follow it anyway. There, you can see the airport ahead of us, right off the nose. Sort of overfly that at 2,500, so well above pattern altitude. See the pattern altitude down there. 1200s or a thousand feet above that. Another feature that I discovered in four flight is you can review your entire flight in 3D. It'll follow your entire flight and you can fast forward it as it moves along, but it shows you all the terrain in three dimensions based on satellite imagery for your entire flight and you can also do the same just for your planned flight you can actually pre-review all the terrain from departure to destination that's pretty cool stuff so that's sanderson field that looks like we're we're hanging in there with the vfr marginal. Looks like we just lost for some reason. Our, must be. It, I think it's a Wi-Fi issue. We'll go ahead and make that disappear for now so we don't get confused by it.
So I'm looking right now at four flight, even though I, I don't have the, it's not syncing with X-Plane, and so it's not showing my position on the map. But I am looking at the minimum, the maximum elevation figures on the sectional, and at our present altitude and heading, uh, there is no terrain between us and the coast. airport right here, right there, should be Hoquiam, which I have programmed into for flight.
So the airport below us is Elma. It's a private airport.
Cruise 3, Sierra 7. Again, looking at the aeronautical sectional, there is no terrain threats between myself, my present location, and the coast. So right now I'm working off the CDI on the GPS, intercepting the programmed course that's coming in right now, and we're going to turn right to 241. So both our track and bearing right now are 241, so make a right turn at 241. waypoint is going to be Westport, that's 14 Sierra, right on the coast. That leg is 8 nautical miles from Oakville. Right now we're 99.2 over ground. 11 nautical miles from Hoquiam. And then our next waypoint, zoom that out a little bit, is going to be 14 Sierra right here. It's good training for if you ever did get caught in IMC inadvertently. One of these days I'll make a video on what happened to me on my way to my private pilot check ride. I checked the weather at my departure and destination uh, in a VFR, but I wasn't careful enough on my en route planning and didn't fully check the weather between departure and destination. And I was suffering from what they call get there itis. So anxious to get down and do my check ride. And I saw some cloud formations in front of me, and I thought, you know. Uh, it looks just like a puffy cloud, and I'll just punch right through it, get out on the other side, and get on my way down to my check ride. So I went in to that quote-unquote cloud puff, and didn't come out on the other side for 20 minutes. So for 20 minutes, I was in complete IMC, zero visibility, and I thought to myself, I did this in flight training. We did three hours or so of instrument reference training, which is required for a private. But it was very different when you're actually in it. And I don't know how to describe it. It's just as much as I was comfortable flying instrument reference when you're in IMC, actual IMC, it's very, it was very unnerving for the first time. And I will say this. At the time, I had been flying quite a bit of Flight Simulator, the Microsoft Flight Simulator. I think it was version Flight Simulator 98, I believe. And in part of that uh, program, they had, you could earn a private pilot certificate. You could also earn an instrument certificate. And the training was narrated by Rod Machado. And it was actually quite good training. So I went ahead, I actually got the instrument uh, rating even though it's a simulator, it was an instrument rating in Flight Simulator 98. And I attribute that experience, that Flight Simulator training, to saving my life in that situation, literally. Because I was so comfortable flying instruments, 
even though at the time I was a student pilot, I was able to maintain control of the airplane in, in those conditions. Again, it lasted for about 20 minutes. I do remember saying to myself at the time, you know, what am I going to do if I don't come out of this by the time I reach my destination, which was Clash Charlie uh, airspace. So all these things were going through my mind and probably about 40 nautical miles from the airport, 40 or 50 nautical miles to the airport, I came out of the IMC and resumed VFR conditions. So again, that experience uh, gave me a great appreciation for flight simulator training. And to this day, I take it very, very seriously. And as I said, my disclaimer when I began this flight is, do not do this, what I'm doing right now in a VFR flight. I'm doing it because it's a simulator. I'm also doing it because it's training, because if it does happen to you, you need to have a plan. And uh, part of the un unplanned piece today is that the uh, is four flight fail, <laughs> at least on the simulator, and that could happen in real life. So I, I no longer have uh, I no longer have four flight to use to show my position and the terrain below me and the AHARs and all the capabilities that it has. So you notice that I transitioned over to turn back on course 241 because I'm looking down here and that's that's what I need to be on. So we're only 4.7 miles from the airport so I'm going to make a nice gentle standard rate turn to the right to 241. There's 241, so roll out on that. Okay. 4.2 to Hoquiam. So again, I, I have a great appreciation for instrument lifts. There's a hook wheel below us, 3.8 nautical miles to hook wheel. Pass right over that. And hook wheel, and again, I'm looking at four flight. You're not able to see this, but pattern altitude there is 1,000. And we're at 2,300. I would also normally I would tune into the Hopium CTAF frequency, which is uh, 1227, and I would notify them that I'm overflying the airfield at 2300. Okay, so the GPS should now transition over to Westport 14 Sierra. Once we get over station. Now we're doing 99 over ground. It's probably almost windless up here. Looking at four flight again, you don't have the benefit of seeing this, but winds reported at our altitude are 194 at seven knots. So a slight hit. Seven knots. So. Okay, so watching the CDI right here on our Garmin 430. I don't have a Garmin 430 on board the real airplane, so I don't have the benefit of being able to do this here. But I do have a small Garmin GPS, an aviation GPS, that I bought many years ago. It's still fully functional and Today's experience is kind of making me think I probably ought to have that on board. Now I have a backup uh, Apple device. As I said, I have my iPhone, which backs up the iPad, but it's still not a true aviation GPS. It is GPS, but it's not a standalone GPS. So if I had a problem with my my ADS-B receiver, or it ran out of power, or something along those lines. Kind of nice to have that GPS backup, something I have to think about. All right, so now it's switched over 14 Sierra, so we need to change heading to 221. It's just a slight left turn. I'll, I'll actually overshoot it deliberately so I can catch that CDI. looking too great, <laughs> is it? Uh, I don't even have visual contact with the ground here. 
Paris a little bit right there. So I'm looking at four flight here, and you can't see it, but let me try to bring it up again and see what we can. See if we can. Okay. Not showing my position. Yeah, it doesn't see X plane right now. But based on our GPS, we're 5.5 from 14 Sierra. So if Our track is 221, bearing 211. Come left. 190, 185. I'll hold that until we intercept that CPI back on course. Well, I'm kind of bummed that I can't get four flight to work. So, still no visual contact with the ground. Speed over ground 100, 3.1 to Westport. CDI starting to come back in. Again, I'm looking at the aeronautical sectional. There's no terrain below us that poses a threat. In fact, right now we're over water. And the elevation of Westport is 14 feet above sea level. CDI's coming in. Turn back to 221. So the GPS that I have mounts onto the yoke. It's kind of small. So I could have it right here uh, as a backup to the iPad, which is good, which mounts right here on the windscreen.
come just slightly left of 159 to re-intercept the CDI there. We're on the coast, we're right over the coast. So there's no terrain threats, can't see it. So I'm probably gonna switch over to VFR here, so like I said I would. Lesson learned, plan on failures happening. Be ready. Be ready for them, because it will happen. Seventy nautical miles to Nahalem Bay. And I'm about ready to go be a far here. And I kind of see some terrain out there. right there below us. Alright, so I'm going to bring it down to 1,500 feet. Let's see what we can see. I'm going to make sure we're out over the water within glide distance of the shore. So I'm going to come a little bit right of our program course. stuff. I don't really don't want to switch over to force VFR. I like flying real world weather. By the coastline now. And hopefully we'll maintain visual contact with it throughout the flight. There's a thousand. I'm going to hold that. Ground speed is a 110. We are 65 nautical miles from Mandanita, which is Nahalem Bay.
So the Oregon coast it reminds me, I used to live in Maine. There aren't many places in the United States where the mountains come right down to the water. Maine is one of those places. And uh, Oregon and Washington is another. I think it's phenomenal just seeing the variety of terrain coming right down here to the ocean. Really, really cool stuff. It makes for some really awesome flying. So we're looking good here at a thousand. I want to try to maintain this all the way down. Just gonna fly visual reference to the coastline. Anita. This would be Highway 1 right here along the Oregon coast. And one of the cool things about Oregon is that many, many of the beaches allow vehicular traffic. It's actually considered part of the highway, the coastal highway system. So many of the beaches you can just drive right out on them. Not in every case do you need four-wheel drive to do that but it's probably a good idea. So yeah, it looks like we'll be okay. I'm not gonna fiddle with the weather. I am gonna look and see what the altimeter setting is. You don't have the benefit of seeing this. Let me try one more time here to bring it up. So I'll turn to 3016, one's 2806. 3016. Looks like we are already there. And we're going to expect winds 280. The Halem's runway 33. So we'll have a, a slight crosswind from the left, which is exactly what it was just the other day when I flew it. So one thing to be mindful of is, as I said, because the mountains come right down to the water, you can be flying the coastline, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that these, these mountains, they come right down to the coast. So if you're not paying attention, you could end up doing what they call controlled flight into terrain, and I don't want to be a CFIT victim. So if you look right here at Astoria, this 1.6, that's 1,600 foot cloud ceilings, which is pretty close to what we're experiencing up here right now. So we're showing sixty nautical miles to Nahila Bay. So that would be our position on four flight. Right about in here. I'm gonna intercept course for our 
GPS there. safe from 
remaining terrain. So I'm going to bring it right back on course. right now I'm turning the airplane to intercept this course which looking at for flight keeps me clear of any kind of terrain threats between here and Manzanita sketchy. hope it's better down at Manzanita. to go. Manzanita. And we're doing 99 over ground. So I'm looking at four flight right now. Let's see if I can get it. Come up again. Okay. So looking at four flight right now. If you look down here at Tillamook, cloud ceilings at Tillamook are 2,000. They're reporting ceiling broken 2,000, 
ten statute miles visibility that's pretty good news i mean that's an indication that the conditions may improve for us as we head further south so we are now 42 miles from the Halem Bay us
boss capable GPS where it can make an instrument approach, but it does have a ILS, so I would look for, ask for an airport that has uh, an instrument landing system. And put it down on the ground. It doesn't matter where it is, what matters is you stay alive. A lot of the uh, airplane accident studies that I reviewed, the pilots were reluctant to land at an airport where they otherwise could have made a safe landing because it was so far from their desired destination. Again, that's that's the this get their itis syndrome that I talked about earlier. What matters is not where you end up, but that you're safe. You could always rent a car, wait for good weather. There's lots of options, but there's no substitute for, for being safe. <clears throat> okay, 34 to go to Manzanita. Traffic pattern altitude there is 1,000. CTEF we already have programmed in. Showing 1,800 on a four flight at Astoria. Definitely not seeing that right here. And 2,700 now down at Tillamook. So there is a chance that it will break out of this.
this is where the cloud ceilings on four flight are reported at 1,800. It's kind of agrees with what we're seeing here. There is the Columbia River, and then up further right there, it meets the Pacific Ocean. Really rough waters in there, always turbulent. 27 to Manzanita. south the seaside over here is Cannon Beach, the other side of this point. And the weather reported at seaside Ceiling broken, 1,800. <laughs> 10 statute miles visibility. Winds 2508. sectional 3,200 here because there's some mountainous terrain right there and 4,100 here so we're gonna we're gonna stay over the water we're gonna turn right here and come around this point see if I have any procession going on on the, like, on the compass Six zero.
seaside right there. I'm going to make a right turn and go around this point. It's a good sign that we have visual reference to the ground for our landing at Nahalem Bay. <coughs> 20 to go. And we're doing just under 100 knots over ground. Or 115 miles an hour. Shouldn't take us too long to get down in there. like as we approach it from the coast, just kind of like that. So we're going to look for this, this canal right here. This gives us a good reference to make our approach here to runway 33. Most of the flying here in Washington and Oregon is a sight for sore eyes, as they say. Eighteen to go. We'll give a call at ten miles out and then we'll call our final. We'll come in on a left base and we'll call the left base and then final. So for a visual reference, you kind of see it's nestled here in this, this little bay. So we're going to start looking for it as soon as we pass this point. We'll run parallel, come in on a left base, and then final for runway 33. So just the other side of this point, we'll see Cannon Beach and what they call Haystack Rock, which is a great landmark to see from the air. <coughs> it's what's known as a monolith, a large stone protruding from the ocean. It's a standalone feature. And there's bunches of them along the Oregon coast.
13 to go, Manzanita. There you see Cannon Beach. That's just off to our left. Right there. That's the town of Cannon Beach. <coughs> so we're looking for this point. We're gonna, as soon as we come around that, we're going to start looking for the airport. <coughs> and we'll stay at 1,000 feet, which is pattern altitude. That's the point right there at our 11 o'clock and 11 miles out. Cherokee 7428 Romeo is one zero miles north, landing runway 33 in Allen Bay. <coughs> Bummed about that for flight. Once I come around that point, if I fly heading 150, it should be parallel to the runway. And then I'll turn into the coastline onto left base for runway 33. All right, so go through a pre landing checklist. And once we get on to our downwind leg, I'll go ahead and put the fuel pump on. <clears throat> I'm going to switch fuel tanks now to the fuller tank, which is the right tank. And we'll, uh, this mixture is already set to full rich. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and put the fuel pump on and pull the carp heat. See if we can pick 
check out the runway. Quite see it yet. Here we can see the bay. Right there. And the airport. It should be right there. That's the town we're seeing off the, right there at 10 o'clock. That's the Halo Bay, that's it right there. All right, so fuel pump on, landing light is already on, car B. <coughs> Mixture set to full rich. The Halo Bay traffic chart is 742 at Romeo, is entering a left downwind for runway 33 to Halo Bay. power, maintain pattern altitude 1000. There's the runway. Here's the threshold, pull power back to 1700, and first notch flaps. <coughs> Traffic Cherokee 742 Romeo is turning left base for runway 33 to Helen Bay. And second notch flaps, maintain 90. Bay traffic Cherokee 7428 Romeo is turning final for runway 33 to Helen Bay. <coughs> Crosswind just like we thought. So we put in some right rudder. Pull power back. And we're on the ground. Flaps. Now the cool thing about this air, uh, airport is it's actually a campground <clears throat> and you can taxi off onto the grass, in fact you have to. So right here at the end we'll go ahead and taxi onto the grass. And then they have uh, tie down areas right on the grass and you can walk to your campsite, camp right near your airplane. 
course, that's not modeled in here, but that's what it's like. In real world, not as many trees here uh, in the in four flight or in uh, X plane. In right, right here, there's lots of trees around. shutdown do a quick debrief so engine shutdown parking brake set radio transponder off so we're gonna do master avionics transponder off all switches off and master off and ignition off Let's go ahead and take a look to the extent we're able at our ground track. <clears throat> Again, we were following the coastline, and there were times when we lost visual with the ground where we, where we so we're just following the coast right here, just like that. And then there were times when we lost visual reference to the ground, so we we went with our uh, GPS. So following the coastline, <clears throat> and there's our downwind left base and final for runway 33. So again, I know I've said it, it's like beating a dead horse, but in, in the real world, you, we, we would not do what we did today. Yeah, it's VFR into IMC conditions. We I, I deliberately did that because it is a simulator. I did it for training purposes for myself, for my own benefit. And uh, I also like to stay in real world weather when I fly. Um, we had, <clears throat> it's not an emergency, but we did lose our four flight our uh, ADSB capability. <clears throat> of course, in a simulator, that was a result of a Wi-Fi failure, but you could have a Wi-Fi failure in the airplane too. Your ADSB is a Wi-Fi device. Your also your device also relies on GPS signals, um, provided you have an iPad that has cell phone capability, which also has a built-in GPS. So the ADSB has a WAS GPS in it, and your device itself in my case, does have a GPS built in it. So there is some redundancy there, but those can all fail. And so in this case, we, we resorted to a GPS. Now, the real world airplane I fly does not have uh, a GPS on board. This one did, so I used it. <clears throat> there are alternatives if you didn't have that to get the airplane safely on the ground. We talked through some of those uh, in flight. In any case, I uh, hope you enjoyed the videos, the still photos. Um, thanks for sticking with me on this long cross-country flight today. Uh, appreciate you joining me and look forward to doing it again next time.